Our next presenter is my good friend, <clears throat> whom I've known for well over 20 years, Julie Wagner. She holds a PhD. She uh, was at the University of Arizona, my alma mater. Uh, she is also an editor of the Journal of Extracorporeal Technology, and uh, she has been working with TEG for a very long time. Julie Wagner. Thanks, Joe. Um, Appreciate you inviting me to this meeting and um, giving me, again, an opportunity to talk about TEG. Um, for disclosure, I do do a little bit of consulting for hemonetics now, um, but other than that, I'm not um, really employed by them. So, But I do enjoy talking about TEG, um, and I have had little experience with the other viscoelastic tests, so that's why I'm going to be mainly looking at the TEG uh, stuff today and interpretation of it. There we go. So, first of all, coagulation, hemostasis, extremely complex stuff. Applying what we're going to get from the TEG or any other um, testing apparatus that gives you information about coagulation, also extremely complex and fraught with a lot of different things that you have to think about. Interpreting the TEG, though, I would say is somewhat uh, easy type, type of thing. It's not rocket science. And you can get some good information from it, and from that, then go on and talk to, or give you some information about what could possibly be going on in that patient. So first of all, what makes a good clot? That's where it all starts from, is understanding what is required to make a good clot. And by good clot, it's something that's going to stop bleeding um, from that patient and not overdo it to get into the hypercoagulable state. So step one is number one, you have to get a proper location. So when you have injury in the vessel, you have a place where platelets can um, attach, and you need those platelets to attach to be able to form a good clot. And the other thing is that you're going to have tissue factor being released, which activates the coagulation cascade, from what you understand, back, way back when you took biochem and had this in perfusion school and such. So once you have that, then clot can start or the possibility of clot can start um, being taking place. So the next step is you need thrombin generation. Thrombin generation, you need it to get beyond a certain threshold for clot to actually start to be formed. And this just shows the um, graphic, just shows the red one is thrombin generation in a test tube, and then the blue one is the actual clot formation. And what happens is that once you reach a certain threshold, of that thrombin generation, clot can start to form. Oops, didn't want to do that. OK. Um, and so once you do get that initiation of thrombin generation, now you get platelet feedback, activation feedback, again, which is required to get good clot formation, and accelerated thrombin generation, which is needed to get a beyond that threshold. OK, step three, once that threshold is reached, now you can localize, you get localized fibrin formation. And again, that fibrin is kind of the bricks or the mortar, mortar that brings together the platelets and holds the clot into place because you need a stable clot and that's going to help with that. And then step four, good clot formation is a strong and stable clot that's going to be able to withhold the, um, the strength with, uh, during uh, blood flow because all this does occur in flowing blood vessels. Um, and so you need to have platelets, you need fibrinogen that holds together the platelets as well as creates the fibrin, and then the fibrin mesh that kind of goes over to, to stabilize it all. And that's what it is. So the components then are location and activator, which is typically tissue factor. Um, and those two are in a pr uh, different because those are the two things we can't measure outside the body. And then the rest of them are the coagulation factors that are required for thrombin generation, also an environment free of anticoagulants, something that blocks thrombin. Platelets, again, environment free from platelet inhibitors, fibrinogen, and an environment with minimal um, lysis. Okay, so how does all this relate to the monitoring with the TEG or uh, VES, viscoelastic uh, device? So this is your basic um, tracing, TEG tracing. 
Um, and what we have here is we have initiation, which again, Mike kind of talked about a little bit, so I'm just gonna go backwards a little bit and uh, try to piece together some of this information that he gave. It's state, basically the initiation from the time the, the coagulation pathways are activated in this in vitro environment. Um, and those different types of activators with the normal tag is kaolin. With the rapid tag, it's tissue factor and another type of little activator. But basically, there are two different activators, which is why with the rapid tag that you can get it much faster results. Um, also going on is that whole activation process. You're getting that thrombin generation up to the point where you reach that threshold and start forming fibrin. Um, and again, another important point is that your ACTs, your PTs, your PTTs all stop once fibrin, the initial fibrin is formed. And so this is actually gonna go beyond what that is, it's a whole blood test. Okay, so next it's the buildup, which is the K and the angle values, kind of demonstrates how the platelets, the fibrinogen, and the coagulation factors, specifically thrombin, are all coming together to allow the clot to start building up to its maximum strength. The MA is the maximum amplitude. That's the maximum strength of the clot that's formed in the in vitro environment. And then finally, if it does occur, if there's plasma, any type of plasma in the blood at the time you take this blood sample, then you might see fibrinolysis. So it basically takes you through the entire life cycle of a clot that um, the TEG analysis does. So first of all, one of the best things you can do is just, once you get good at TEG analysis, is that you start seeing patterns. And those patterns are gonna be based on the R, the angle K values, the MA, and fibrinolysis. All of those different things come together to give you the pattern that you can then potentially identify what's going on with this patient. So on the green, it's the hemorrhagic or the bleeding patient. You'll have a low clotting factors typically associated with a long R value or a long initiation point to be when fibrin first starts being formed. Um, the second one is low platelet function, small MA, not very strong clot, meaning it will probably break down when you have blood flow or an increase in blood pressure. Um, the next one down is suggests a low fibrinogen level, um, although there could be other issues also associated with that, but since fibrinogen is a coagulation factor, it's going to be, um, again, a difference in one of the major clinical or coagulation factors and also the coagulation factor that decreases first to its critical level with hemodilution. So it's always good to start looking at fibrin fibrinogen. And then primary fibrinolysis, which um, Mike showed a good case of, and a hypocoagulable state, which basically said there's a platelets, coagulation factors, fibrinogen, all of those things could be together causing the patient to bleed. Um, but knowing that pattern, that there could be more than just one issue and understanding that and then treating it based on that, so. On the hypercoagulable side, although in perfusion, cardiac surgery in the OR, this is not typically something that you're gonna be dealing with, but remember that these types of factors can, by treating patients, you can cause a hypercoagulable state. And so up in the ICU, you know, being, seeing this happen, um, especially with PCCs, um, not so much with fibrinogen, um, but I've seen it happen, um, giving some of these different drugs, and it's good to know what's happening so that you can treat it immediately because a clot is sometimes worse than just bleeding and dealing with that clot. So again, platelet hypercoagulability and high MA value, uh, enzymatic hypercoagulable, with low R value, platelet ens enzymatic hypercoagulable, both coagulation factors and platelets being involved, and then, as Mike indicated, secondary fibrinolysis being associated with um, excess, or having hypercoagulability, and then fibrinolysis being a protective mechanism for that patient. All right, so the basic TEG tracing, this again is from the 5000, not the TEG 6S. 
Um, and what you see down below is the R, the K, the angle, the MA, and the LY30, which are giving you information about initiation, um, buildup, and breakdown of that clot that we saw in that initial one. The values that you have are given basically or put together. You can either do it from the institutional wise, that you can get these normal values, or of course now Hemonetics has a huge database and they're, dem or they're formed or generated from that huge database of patients, of all types of patients. So um, those are the normal values then. Um, and so from that, you can use the number if you don't trust your pattern gener or pattern recognition, you can actually use the numbers to start figuring out exactly what type of issue you may be having with a patient with, a with respect to a coagulopathy. And so again, the R value, the K and the angle value are talking about the buildup of that clot and also the platelets then are associated with that. MA is typically associated with platelet function and or number. And then, of course, the breakdown is your LY30. So with that, I'm just going to go through a few examples, the very basic examples um, from this. And so the first example, again, pattern recognition, and then checking it based on the values that you actually get. So the, you see the R value is out of range, suggesting something is an issue with your initiation. Um, again, I, what I don't show on this is the heparinase. These are all assuming that the heparin, if there was any heparin on board, has been reversed. So an X, a long R value would suggest that um, it's something to do with um, coagulation factors. All right. Then the K and the angle are within normal ranges. And then the MA value is also within normal ranges. So based on this, it would suggest that there's an issue with the amount of coagulation factors you have on board. You just don't have enough to generate the thrombin necessary to get to that threshold value, and therefore um, you need, potentially may need to have coag or FFP or some type of coagulation factor. The issue with that, though, and to a certain extent, is that once you do get thrombin generation, you get good clot formation. So, um, you know, how much FFP you give, this is where that whole art of, you know, being an MD comes in and understanding your experience. What should I do with this patient? Should I give FFP? Or just see if something, if they stop bleeding on their own. It could be a temperature problem. They just need to warm up a little bit more to get the whole co uh, proteins going. And, um, or it could actually be something that you need to treat with a, with a drug or with a blood product. So typically hemorrhagic, a bleeding patient, and potentially low clotting factors. Also remember that there could be other issues. Example number two, again, suggests there might be some issue with um, the R value is normal. The K value is within normal range. The angle is a little bit decreased, suggesting that the rate at which the clot forms is slowed down. So that could be an issue with coagulation factors, generating thrombin quick enough, and or platelets. And the MA value is low. So it suggests fixing the MA with more platelets might be the appropriate um, treatment here. Because the MA is low, it might fix the other problem. So again, this patient could be bleeding. And if they are bleeding, more than likely it's because of the low platelet function and or number. The next case is a hypercoagulable case. Again, just looking at the pattern, you can see that the MA is very high. Um, and it, in this case, it's 76, so it's above normal value, suggesting it's hypercoagulable. Um, the, the R value is within normal range. The K is low because it Again, the hypercoagulable state, thrombin generates very quickly, activates those platelets, and the platelets um, are then increasing the strength of that clot. And so from that, now you have to decide the patient, you know, again, this is not something you typically see in the OR in cardiac surgery patients post-op, but it could be something that you might see up in the ICU and need to be dealt with. 
So hypercoagulable, most likely platelet hypercoagulability in this case. Um, here's another one which demonstrates, again, you see that the pattern recognition, MA, very high. Um, hypercoagulable platelets are definitely being activated in this case, but also the R value is very low, suggesting that thrombin is being generated very quickly and activating and potentially activating those platelets to a, a different degree. So it, again, it just demonstrates there's an issue here. If this patient is bleeding, there's some other issue. It's not because the coagulation system is not working, at least in this tube of blood that you're measuring. So hypercoagulable platelet and enzymatic hypercoagulability, both of those issues are intact here. All right, so example number four, a normal patient. A normal patient that's bleeding. So what's going on with this? So sometimes, typically when I first started as a clinical specialist for TAG, you had to kind of go tell the surgeon that there might be an issue with some, that there might be some other issue that you might want to take a look to make sure that you didn't miss any of those little holes that are continuing bleeding. Um, but when you have diffuse bleeding, it could be another issue. And the limitation of the TAG is that you're measuring in vitro you're just measuring what's in the blood. You're not measuring that activator factors, and you're not measuring the endothelium or those, um, the vessel issues. And so you have to kind of consider there might be something that we can't measure here and go with that and understand that there are limitations to the tag, but in most cases, if you see a normal tag, in this case, you probably wouldn't have to treat with FFP, platelets, um, cryoprecipitate, fibrinogen le uh, levels or concentrate or anything like that because that's not going to make this any better. It could actually make it worse. And so we just need to go with something like Mike would say DDABP that might help with the endothelium um, and or talk to the surgeon, see if there's some other issue that you might need to look at relative to that. And so that is um, the TEG, um, again, coagulation, hemostasis, extremely complex. There's more and more proteins coming in every day that add to the complexity of the whole issue. Understanding it just based on one test is, not, um, is very difficult to do. Um, applying this information, again, very complex because there's a lot of issues that you have to think about. But understanding what the TAG is telling you is not that complex, and hopefully I've kind of showed that the R, the K, the MA, the alpha value, and the lysis are all pieces of the puzzle that you can use to take it to the next level to, to make um, better, decision or better decisions regarding what the treatment should be for that patient. So any questions? Well, I guess we'll do questions later, but that's it. Thank you.